<laughs> I was like, what, what, what do I need to do? <laughs> Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to our virtual uh, K-State Research and Extension Pastor Management meeting. Um, as you know, we are faced with a kind of a different situation here with the pandemic. So uh, we switched a lot of our meetings to virtual. So we are glad that you could join us this afternoon. My name is Sandra Wick. I'm the crop production agent with the Post Rock Extension District. And so we are thankful that you could join us this afternoon. And um, um, please let us know um, if you're on, you must not be having any trouble. But if you know some of your friends or neighbors or whatever that's having any trouble, just call any of the extension offices. And we should be able to help you out. So we have several other extension agents and extension districts that are also helping with this. So I'm gonna turn it over to Alicia Bohr. Thank you, Sandra. Um, our collaboration team for the, this meeting on pasture management is Justine Henderson. She is the livestock agent for the Central Kansas District. Myself, I am Alicia Bohr, and I am the agriculture agent, one of them for the Cottonwood District, and I am housed out of the Great Bend office. We have Clint Laughlin, the director and livestock agent for the Midway District. Brett Melton is the livestock agent for the River Valley District. And then Sandra Wick, who you've already met, is the crop production agent for the Post Rock District. Um, we would also like to thank, thank Arthur Selman, um, who is helping us put this on. He is the technical aspect for the agronomy department, and he has helped us mesh um, onto YouTube Live today. And then I'd also like to thank the two presenters that are willing to do this today, um, we, Keith Hermony and Walt Fick. So without further ado, we will let, we will let um, somebody introduce Walt. Okay, and that somebody would be me. My name is Brett Melton, and I, I will be introducing Dr. Walter Fick today. Uh, he is a professor and a professor and extension range management specialist in the Department of Agronomy at Kansas State University, and he has responsibilities in teaching, research, and extension. His major areas of interest include invasive species, prescribed burning, and grazing management. And we will uh, go ahead and move over and put uh, Walter's slides up and let him take the reins. Brett, while he's getting those up, can you let people know about questions in the chat box? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you have any questions, you'll see the chat box up onto the right of your YouTube screen. Uh, if you're on a mobile device, it might be up to the bottom. Uh, but feel free to type those in as we go through today. Um, anything that comes to mind, uh, you can ask Walt and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Um, so again, feel free to type them in as we go through the presentation. Okay, well, thanks, Brett, for the introduction. I was asked to talk to you today about pasture management and, and weed control, so we'll get right into that. I'll uh, start off with talking about some basic principles of grazing management and then get into some uh, brush and weed control, uh, some specifics on, on certain species, and hopefully then we have time for, for any questions that you might have. I uh, wanted to emphasize, of course, that, that Kansas is a a range in pasture state. And uh, this set of data would indicate, you know, something over 15 and a half million acres of what's called pasture land in this particular ag census. Uh, most of that I think actually is range land because I know there's an additional, oh, two, two and a half million acres of tame forages, uh, primarily in the Eastern part of Kansas, you know, smooth brome, a tall fescue and, and Bermuda grass. Um, so a little bit about grazing management, uh, kind of animal or something that we, we might be able to select. Kansas is indeed a, a beef state, uh, 6 million head of cattle, maybe 
uh, 1.4 million or so head of uh, beef cows. Uh, but there are other livestock out there that are grazing, uh, including sheep and, and goats. Uh, one can talk about season of use, uh, distribution of grazing, stocking rate, and, and then grazing system. And I'm not going to cover too much of those topics other than bring them to your attention. The key one of those that I would like to emphasize, however, is stocking rate. And the stocking rate is the, the number of animals per unit area for a given period of time. And uh, this is this long-term study that was done uh, at Hayes. Uh, but as one increases that stocking rate, otherwise less acres per animal, you can see this blue line here that the performance on an individual basis, uh, the gains on those livestock decline. However, as we increase that stocking rate, uh, we look at the other line, we can actually increase the, the gain per acre, at least up to a point. And somewhere there in the middle, not necessarily where those two lines cross, but somewhere in this general area is usually what we consider a moderate stocking rate, at least for season long grazing. And that has also shown, has been shown to be the most economical uh, rate to use as well in these studies that have been done. Um, a little bit on successful grazing management and you know, knowing when uh, buds are being formed, like I say, in our tall grasses, so particularly our rhizominous species, those buds are often formed in the late season. Um, but then, you know, you need that bud or mare stem for those plants to grow. But then we also want to be concerned about the TNC, the total non-structural carbohydrates that are in the plant and how those can affect uh, regrowth in plant vigor. Uh, but most of the time with our grazing management, we're trying to uh, manage the amount of leaf area that, that we leave. And we do that with a little level of defoliation uh, that occurs. And depending on the plant species we're working with, we can actually defoliate plants uh, at certain stages that will actually then stimulate additional tiller development. And again, of course, we're, we usually rest uh, for the plants and we're you know, grazing then trying to meet the, the animal's needs. And many times we can indeed do that with various uh, grazing programs or grazing systems that are available. Uh, sometimes we talk about overgrazing or, or overuse and, and uh, that can occur, but really one of the better ways to define that rather than maybe removing too much of the leaf area is maybe overgrazing as we just haven't provided rest for the plants. So uh, here's some, some uh, information to share is, is that, you know, we need to allow time for these plants to rest to recover their uh, vigor following defoliation. And the late summer time frame is going to be most important for our warm season grasses. And in our system, I'm talking about kind of August and September. Uh, if we had cool season grasses that we're working with, then summer rest would be important. Before we get into how do we go about maybe controlling or managing various brush and weed species, one needs to be uh, concerned or aware of why do these plants invade? And of course, you know, in eastern Kansas, it's pretty obvious uh, that if we take fire out of the system, uh, we can go to a forest in a matter of uh, about three or four decades. Uh, but woody plants invade in, in the rest of the state as well, maybe just not as, as rapidly. Uh, climatic fluctuations do occur. You know, we're kind of in a dry period now. Uh, drought indeed uh, can benefit certain species over others or at least maybe some plants are able to survive drought better. Uh, but then on the other extreme, during wet periods, we can also have uh, that may in favor other species. Seeds are transported by animals, wind and water. Uh, overuse by grazing by domestic livestock indeed has been associated in some cases with brush and weed invasion. And again, with tame pastures, oftentimes we need to make sure we're, we're using good fertility. So bring these to your attention because it's important to understand, you know, why uh, these unwanted plants may invade because otherwise we may just be treating a symptom rather than trying to uh, solve the problem. So weeds, of course, are plants growing out of place. Here's a list then of some annual, biennial and perennial species that we have in the state. 
Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of these. Uh, if you have questions at some point today, you can ask questions. But I'm going to talk about the two biennial species listed, uh, musk thistle and, and common mullen. And then the perennials, uh, I'm going to talk about primarily curly cup gumweed. Uh, but again, if you have questions about these others, bring them to my attention. The brush species then, the unwanted woody plants, a number of those, we have shrubs, you know, the smaller growing plants. Many of these are, are multi-stem species. Uh, buck brush is pretty common. I'll talk about control of that species as well as the rough leaf dogwood. Uh, blackberry and moliflora rose are probably more problems in eastern Kansas. Eastern red cedar is starting to occur throughout the state. So I'll talk about management of that species uh, somewhat as well. So as we think about control and management, uh, these are kind of the, our toolbox or the options that we have available to us. Uh, I'm a, remember, I'm a range guy, so I've got grazing management there at the top of the list, and we'll bring that in a little bit. But primarily, again, you know, maintaining cover and, and not overgrazing becomes important. But then we have mechanical methods, prescribed burning, biological control, and then the use of herbicides or, or chemical control. So as, before we get into those, though, again, I want to point out that some of these plants that we think of as weeds uh, may actually have some value to them. They can add to the production and forage quality for grazing animals, for instance. Uh, we know that sheep, goats, and deer browse on the woody plants, but cattle eat certain woody plants at given times of the year as well. Uh, these plants help protect watersheds, uh, legumes that we have in our pastures, at least have the potential to fix nitrogen uh, during the summertime, you know, trees or uh, things like that can provide shade then for, for cattle uh, and then for winter protection as well. And then wildlife species use many of these different, this uh, diversity of plant species that we have uh, for cover and, and food sources. So here are four species and, and again, these have been shown to be eaten by cows here in, in the Flint Hills where I work, but these species occur throughout the state pretty much. And, you know, dotted gay feather uh, is pretty common. It's a late bloomer, liatra species. Heath asters are most common aster in the state. Lead plant is a, a shrub. It's a legume, but cows eat it uh, fairly frequently. And then a, a native legume, prairie, purple prairie clover, is another one that livestock will tend to consume. And these type of species, you know, we know that cattle are, are grass eaters, but typically more than 25% of their diet, assuming these other plants are available, will be made up of things other than grass. So as you think about then getting into control options, you know, mechanical control, again, uh, hand tools, these little loppers we might take out and, and cut individual plants off. Uh, mowing machines can be beneficial for maybe for working with uh, smaller stem shrubs, or for uh, herbaceous plants, uh, weeds, uh, particularly the annuals and biennials that are reproducing by seed. We could mow in a timely fashion to prevent seed production. And then we have the two examples of tree cutters here, the turbo saw there on, on the top and, and the hydro axe on, on the bottom, uh, both clipping uh, woody plants right off of the soil surface. And then an extreme example would be using a bulldozer to shear trees off. Uh, so eastern red cedar is a non-sprouting species. And here's a, a demonstration where they're using a, a tree cutter, to, you know, cutting it off right at the ground level. Very effective on eastern red cedar since it doesn't re-sprout. What about prescribed burning? We know that prescribed burning has been used uh, for a number of years to enhance livestock gain, particularly then with stalker animals. Uh, we can improve grazing distribution. And then we can use prescribed burning as well for brush and, and weed control, uh, depending primarily on, on timing to a certain extent. Uh, most woody plants, for instance, about need to be leafed out in order to cause much damage uh, with fire. Uh, the exception to that, of course, would be eastern red cedar since it's an evergreen. And anytime we can get a fire to carry through a stand of eastern red cedar, we can do some damage to that species. So here's an example then where eastern red cedar was burned. This was up in north central Kansas, again, Smith or Jewell County, that part of the 
of the state. Again, some of these trees were several feet tall and you see they're desiccated, the brown needles are clear to the top of those trees. Um, so you had to have a pretty good fuel load to do that. Uh, you know, maybe 1,000, 1,500 pounds of fuel, plus probably a little more wind and lower humidity uh, that would help uh, in order to carry a fire and, and uh, control uh, eastern red cedar. The best example we probably have for biological control would be the musk thistle head weevil. So here's a picture of both the adult beetle up there in the upper left, and then the larvae working in the musk thistle the terminal head. And uh, these have been effective in, in reducing stands, uh, although we still have plenty of musk thistle in the state, but I don't see those densest stands maybe as I used to see. And I think uh, the head weevil has indeed helped uh, reduce seed production uh, over a period of time. One of the regulations that have come about though here in the last couple of years is that we're no longer supposed to be transporting uh, Rhinocillus conicus across state borders. But as I go about this throughout the state of Kansas, like say across the, the north central part of the state and eastern Kansas, it's pretty rare when I, I don't find uh, some musk thistle head weevil you know, during the month of June where the the larvae are either working on the head or the beetles are starting to emerge. I've got a picture here of some goats. I, you know, is that biological control or at least it, using a different animal helping us with our grazing management? And you can see these goats have done a pretty good job here defoliating this woody plant. Now, this happens to be salt cedar down in Meade County. But, you know, by defoliation of, of these plants allows the light to reach the soil surface again. And if there's uh, herbaceous vegetation there, then it will start to recover over, over time. Chemicals, of course, uh, we, we use those for treating uh, unwanted species and those can be broadcast or we may use spot treatment or individual plant treatments, different volumes, you know, you know, by ground, we might be talking about 15, 20 gallons per acre, by air, maybe two or three gallons per acre. What I usually think of high volume treatments, so I'm thinking about maybe 50 to 100 gallons per acre. Uh, so different volumes. Uh, we can, and we have basal and cut stump treatments. We'll hear some about that from, from uh, Keith here later. And then some of our products we have are actually soil applied, either in a pelleted form or, or as a liquid. So I'll get into some individual plant data. And so we'll start here with musk thistle. And uh, musk thistle is a statewide noxious weed. It's it's been in the state for many, many years, since the 1930s. Um, again, in, a, in any given year, maybe the estimates is about 750 to a million acres being infested with musk thistle in the state of Kansas. So there's plenty around. You can see in the photos here at the bottom, uh, the rosette here on, on the left, you know, the plant spends most of its life cycle in that stage, maybe 90% of the time. Uh, it, it's a, generally a biennial meaning it may, it may germinate in the spring of the year, grows all summer long in, the, in that rosette stage, goes through the winter and bolts and flowers in the second year. So it took two years to complete its life cycle. So here we have a bolted thistle without showing any flower color. I like to show people that picture because most all the herbicides that we have uh, for broadleaf weed control will control musk thistle as you catch it at that stage. However, once they start to bloom, as you see there on the right, then that list goes down and, and you and control usually is, is reduced. So in this study, there were actually three dates of application there between May 16th and the 29th. Uh, let's focus on the right-hand column because there's lots of data here. And as if you go down these, these right-hand num numbers here, you can see you know, 90 to 100% control. And those were probably in that mid-May treatment date with these particular compounds. Uh, again, the, the lower treatments then were probably you know, the, the May 29th, so that's why the range. But milestone, of course, is amino pyrrolid. Uh, open side is the same as chaparral, it's amino pyrrolid uh, plus metsulfuron. Then we have our, maybe our longer term standard type of treatments on musk thistle, Tordon 22K plus 24D and Escort plus 24D. Um, when you start, if you wanted to compare the prices on these products, actually the most economical treatment there would be the Escort plus 2,4-D uh, because um, they're just much cheaper than these other products, although they all 
are quite effective. Another set of data on musk thistle control was from a December treatment. And again, I was using the milestone, Tordon, 2,4-D, and Chaparral. Again, so at the time these plants were treated, uh, you know, there'd been some freezes, uh, but the plants uh, had not, were still green, had some green tissue in them, so that they would absorb a herbicide. Um, frankly, all these herbicides controlled the rosettes that were present at the time of treatment. However, uh, when I evaluated the plots then uh, the following uh, July, then you could see there are certain treatments were much better than the others. And, and the difference is, is that Milestone and Tordon and Chaparral have chemicals, particularly the, the amino pyrrolid then and picloram that have some soil activity, but they also carry over. They have some residual activity. So they work much better in terms of taking care of new seedlings, you know, that following spring compared to something like 2,4-D. Okay, what about common mullein? It's another introduced plant like musk thistle. It's a biennial. So again, uh, the top photo that you see here is showing uh, in a rosette stage. Uh, what really characterizes this plant, it's a very woolly or hairy plant. And uh, it, uh, this probably picture was taken, I think, in April, then May, June rolls around and the plant will bold and, and flower. It gets a small, small, fairly dense number of yellow flowers on a head there, somewhat like a wand. Um, these plants can get quite tall, uh, maybe up to seven feet tall. Um, because of that woolly nature of the leaf though, uh, herbicides, uh, if they're gonna be effective, probably gonna need to have a, a non-ionic surfactant to help uh, get through that uh, leaf surface. So here's some data. Actually, this is from Nebraska, and uh, it was done Blue Hills up off of 281 there in kind of south central part of the state, as I recall. And again, they had both some spring and fall treatments because uh, uh, mullein can be a rosette in the fall time of the year. So again, the, the treatments that they used or that I'm showing here, again, the picloram treatments surmount, picloram plus, plus fluoroxypur, Overdrive, if you're not familiar with that product, that's a dicamba product with diflufenzapyr in it. Cimarron is basically the same as Ally or Escort, just a different trade name that was used at the time the study was done. And then Clarity, of course, is a dicamba product. So you can see all those treatments when they, on common mullein when they were rosettes in the spring were highly effective in this study. And they did have NIS in all these treatments, and they also used ammonium sulfate on it. 2% volume to volume basis. However, when you look at the October 18th ratings, you can see some of these treatments were, were quite effective again. Uh, the picloram treatments, particularly Tordon 22K and Surmount, are giving nearly 100% control. Uh, but some of these others like, like Overdrive uh, was, was not very effective. Cimarron was not very effective in the fall as well. And as you look at those Ally Escort type labels, uh, and maybe even on dicamba labels, if we don't have good growing conditions, if it happens to be dry, uh, those products may not be too effective. So in the fall, there are some treatments that would be better than others. Again, from an economical standpoint, uh, again, the, you know, if, if you use, and I got to switch over my data here, uh, where I'm using you know, a quarter of an ounce, you know, that two to three tenths ounce of product of met sulfur on is going to be the most economical product in this in this entire list. So here, if, if we look at the 101 days, you know, a little over three months after treatment on studies that I've done here in North Central Kansas, again, there's the milestone uh, forefront, which is uh, amino pyrrolid plus 2,4-D, you know, quite effective. Uh, the met sulfuron at, at quarter ounce was also effective uh, with by itself or sticking weed master with it. Um, one thing I'll point out to you, though, you look at the overdrive by itself, four ounces, you know, is 81% control. But then when I stuck overdrive with, with Ally, uh, control went down. So it must have actually been an, an antagonistic uh, thing that, that occurred there where it was not as effective probably as either product used alone, which that's unusual, but it can indeed occur. Another species I was asked to talk about because it seems to be showing up a little more is curly cup gumweed. Um, 
and it's a oh it, it's a plant that usually no usually no more than two feet tall though I, it can get big if it's in a place where little competition occurs and and typically that's where you're going to see it on disturbed sites maybe along trails or open areas it's considered to be a short life perennial meaning it doesn't leave live for decades maybe two or three years or occasionally it'll act like a biennial species like musk thistle does. As you try to identify that one, of course it has this yellow flower on the top, but if you touch this plant, you'll face, see that it's very sticky uh, throughout the plant and very noticeably in that, thus, thus the name, name gumweed. Um, the leaves themselves, they alternate as they go up the stem. Uh, there's no petiole, in other words, that leaf uh, is pretty much an oval shaped leaf clasp on, onto the stem. And then you'll have kind of rounded or coarsely toothed margins on this particular species. Again, some work I did pulled out of my archives from a number of years ago. I was, obviously, I was looking at the impact of overdrive, although I didn't try overdrive again, which is dicamba by itself in this study for some reason. But we looked at combinations then with picloram. And you can see, again, this is five ratings five weeks after treatment. And some of these were pretty effective. You know, there's uh, picloram plus overdrive, there's 98%. Um, the LSD here is 20, meaning if they is 85, the 32 fluid ounces by itself was, I can't statistically say it was less than the other treatment. Uh, but you can see uh, maybe some minor differences. I'm not sure why the 16 fluid ounces of picloram plus four ounces overdrive uh, was, was lower, but it, that's research sometimes. Uh, again, but looking at the economics here, the, those two two treatments, let's say the straight Tordon 22K, and that's 32 flow ounces, that's, that's a quart. Um, that's, a, you know, multiple times what we use on musk thistle, for instance. Well, that's a pretty expensive treatment, nearly $18 just for the herbicide. If we go down, though, where we had eight fluid ounces of picloram and four ounces of overdrive, similar control, you know, that's a little, little bit cheaper um, of a product for, for treating gumweed. However, if you look at labels and see what other uh, herbicides are available that should indeed control curly cup gumweed, uh, here's a list, chaparral, again, which is the, the metsulfuron plus uh, amino pyrrolid, you know, 12 to 15 bucks, so that's cheaper than those other products. Duracore is a relatively new product that um, Corteva has released. It has the amino pyrrolid in it, but then it also has a, a product we call Rinscore, Again, less than 10 bucks an acre for that herbicide. Grazon, if it works at two pints uh, per acre, would be cheaper. And then, you know, Grazon next is also there. So most all these treatments here are cheaper than the ones that I'd used in another study. And that sometimes it boils down to, you know, do we have an individual target species or do we have multiple species we're trying to control? Because some of these might be better, have a, have a wider range of species they can control than others. So here's our friend Eastern Red Cedar uh, that occurs throughout the state of, of Kansas, uh, getting to be uh, quite a problem. Uh, I don't have any data necessarily to show you, but um, here's my pecking order in terms of trying to control Eastern Red Cedar. And, uh, you know, my first choice, if I can burn, that's probably what I would use. It's very effective on small trees and even larger trees. We can use our management to provide enough uh, fuel to carry a fire or even stacking, cutting off some trees, stacking them under larger trees, running a fire into that can be effective for burning down large uh, red cedar trees. Mechanically, again, if we cut them off below any of the green branches, that's an effective control because this species does not resprout. If you want to use chemicals, there are some available. You know, picloram as, as a liquid is Tordon 22K. That rate is three to four mils per three foot of plant height applied to the soil. Hexazinone is the active ingredient then in Valpar L, which is a liquid, or also in pronone power pellets, dry material. Those can provide some control as well. And then if you use high volume applications of uh, Escort, one to two ounces in 100 gallons of water, or that one to 2% surmount in water can also control uh, Eastern red cedar. Uh, but again, Gets, you know, you get some differences here in terms of cost when you start comparing these various options. What about buckbrush? 
it's a fairly common shrub that occurs throughout the state. You know, across I know across north central clear to northwestern Kansas, you can find it. There is a related species I'll show you a picture of, uh, but it's a smaller growing plant. Often grows in in clumps. Uh, get colonies. It buckbrush actually has stolons that grow across the top of the ground. I know if you try to walk through these and drag drag your feet, you might might even get tripped. A related species then that that you have in starting kind of in north central Kansas going to the northwest would be this western snowberry. So here on the left, this is the snowberry and here on the right is buckbrush. Again, this picture I think was taken in Jewell County and they were both growing there uh, then together. Uh, again, uh, you know, when you see them together like that, well, I could tell them apart. You know, if you saw just one or the other, it's probably a little more difficult at this stage. They both seem to have somewhat ovate leaves. However, once they bloom, you know, flower, and they don't have real uh, noticeable flowers, but when they produce the seed, the snowberry will have a white berry on it, and buckbrush has a red berry. Sometimes these plants, indeed, are called coral berry. So a little data then from buckbrush control, some different dates of application from different studies I've, I've done here in this, uh, this general area. And of course, if you can't catch buckbrush uh, at a proper stage after it's leafed out, just before the, these leaves, they'll kind of go from a light to darker green color. And just about the time that's occurring, that's the ideal time to treat buckbrush with a fully applied herbicide. And that usually occurs by that mid uh, May time frame, and you can see that mid, even late May, 100% control with 2,4-D low volatile ester. But as that plant matures, and the leaf probably is building up a cuticle, control then goes down. Chaparral uh, provided good control there on, on that May 28th date, but then you see it falls off. You might be able to extend control with chaparral by sticking some 2,4-D with it. As you can see there on, even then into early June, you know, we're getting similar control with the chaparral plus 2,4-D as we had with the 2,4-D low volatile ester. Grazon is also can be an effective treatment on buckbrush. Uh, tried Cimarron Plus, which is a combination then of Li and Glean, and you see that it was not very effective. So again, for buckbrush, you know, burning can be very effective. It's usually leafed out at a time of the year we can burn. It may take two or three years in a row to to completely burn through those uh, stands, uh, but that can greatly reduce buckbrush. Uh, repeated mowing at, the, at an early stage after it's leafed out and, and we have a low point in that carbohydrate cycle, which again is generally in that early to mid-May timeframe, that can be effective. And then we have these chemicals that we just talked about. Rough-leaf dogwood is another shrub that we have, although it can become a, a small tree, frankly. Um, it blooms a little later and uh, the timing would be different than it would be on buckbrush. Uh, these, you can see the place plant is still in a bloom stage, has those white flowers and humble shape on the top of the plant. Uh, that generally occurs in late May or up to middle of June. Um, so that's, that's a time frame we usually think about trying to control it, at least with a herbicide. Uh, so here's studies I had done, um, screening a number of products. This actually summarized uh, two locations over two different years of application. Uh, before I, we did this study, I probably was, was recommending a combination of Remedy plus 2,4-D. Well, you notice in this study, you know, the ratings a year after treatment when mortality is determined is only 17%, so that's not very good. So that sure changed our thought on maybe what we ought to use to control it. So you can see these products at the top of this chart, all the way from Banville plus 2,4-D down to the Tordon plus 2,4-D, uh, they'll all, frankly, they'll all defoliate rough leaf dogwood. You know, a month after you treat them, the leaves are, seem like they're brown and falling off, but you come back a year after treatment and the mortality just isn't very high. They're leafing back out or they've re-sprouted from the base or maybe even from above ground stems. So pasture guard at 1%, again, this is a high volume treatment, 1%, that'd be a gallon of pasture guard with 99 gallons of water, you know, gave 50% mortality. Then you can see the little bit, the other ratings there with surmount and, and then this three-way treatment, which is probably what I normally would recommend anymore is, is if we take a picloram, maybe a pint of picloram, two pints of 2,4-D and a pint of remedy, 
Uh, you put those three herbicides together, you can kill uh, most woody plants. But as you can see, the, the mortality is not real high. Uh, this is a pretty difficult plant to control. In fact, maybe using some integrated approach where we're combining treatments might be more effective. Maybe we burn it off, you know, top killed in the spring, let it re-sprout and treat those re-sprouts. Or we could mow it off and the same thing would happen. Uh, it would regrow and then we'd want to time it. And, and from what we understand from the carbohydrate cycle, waiting about four weeks would be the thing to do after uh, that top removal with fire or, or mowing. Uh, we can also use uh, spike pellets to control rough leaf dogwood. We've done that. Uh, again, and we, we've got mortality at least in that 60 to 70 percent range uh, using a spike 20p. So as we think about using all these, these herbicides, uh, just want to remind you there are some grazing restrictions or as you look at these, although most of the product we use, frankly, we can do that with beef animals in the pasture. There's no waiting period before you graze. Uh, however, if you're looking at hay production, then you know there's some it varies depending on the herbicide. And you can see the numbers there for slaughter. I see that 30 days on Banville. I went back to found an old Banville label uh, that's still being marketed and indeed it said 30 days. Uh, but most time that three or four days before slaughter is, is important to, to watch that. So to summarize what I've presented today, you know, again, we, you need to treat these woody species when they first show up. Uh, the longer you wait, you're going to, the cost is going to go up. And treat it when, it when that first plant comes out there, particularly if you know it's got the potential to be a problem species. I rarely recommend broadcast application for control of broadleaf weeds, unless it's indeed affecting maybe grazing distribution, or if I'm working with a noxious weed, such as musk thistle or or Cerisia lespidiza that might uh, indeed uh, warrant uh, you know, a broadcast application initially. So proper grazing management, you know, looking at stocking rates and rest and things like that, use of prescribed burning where we can do that, spot treatment with herbicides. If we do all those sorts of things, generally we will prevent the extensive tree and, and brush problems. So with that, I think I'm, I'm finished presenting and be glad to address any questions that you might have at this point. Hey, thank you, Walter. Um, right now, uh, there was one question in the chat, and it was actually um, mentioned that by Sandra, and uh, it was uh, brought up by Keith that he was going to answer this question in his uh, presentation. But I will go ahead and bring it up now because maybe Keith might or Walt might have another take on it. But it was, why did the curly cup gumweed show up more this year? And do you actually need to control this weed? Is it uh, something that can, will, will become a problem if we don't uh, do something about it? Well, again, I don't, you know, a lot of times these plants show up, uh, maybe rainfall patterns will, will affect them. Uh, Keith, I know he'll talk about the, how, the, how dry periods affected uh, Western ragweed, for instance. Uh, so we'll, we can see that variation from year to year. Most of the time, you know, there's a threshold, you know, these plants have to get to pretty high density, frankly, before it's going to be economical to control them. Uh, and again, I know Keith will, will visit with you about that. Um, so I, again, you know, sometimes uh, uh, we, uh, it's like treating dandelions in your lawn. You know, sometimes we do that just for aesthetics. You know, we don't like the look of them, uh, but it may not indeed be getting, putting anything in our pocket. Because even if I go out there and with a pound, a pound of 2,4-D, if, if that would work, and I don't know that I'd work on that particular species, but that's going to cost you a few bucks an acre just for that herbicide, right? And you put on your, how the application costs, you're getting up 10, 10 bucks or more per acre pretty quickly. Are you going to get that back by treating some of these broadleaf weed species? Uh, so it, it's uh, something one needs to think about, but it, yeah, uh, that's got to be pretty, pretty, I think most of these have to be pretty dense before we need to get too concerned about them. And if I had a poisonous plant or something, that might change what I, how I respond to that question. But uh, I think with the typical broadleaf, that's that's how I would approach it. All right. Um, 
righty. Um, and at this point, we don't have any more questions in the chat, but I encourage anybody, if they have something that came up after Walt finished up, uh, go ahead and put that up in the chat and we will uh, get to it uh, at the end after uh, Keith uh, Keith's presentation. Um, oh, and uh, app, with that, I think we have Clint coming on and he will introduce uh, our next speaker who I've uh, prefaced a few times. Go ahead, Clint. Okay, thank you, Brett. I appreciate uh, the introduction. Again, everybody, we wanna thank you uh, for your time today. We know your time is valuable and hopefully you guys will learn something. Uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce Keith Harmony. Uh, Keith is the Professor of Range Sciences uh, at the KSU Research Center in Hayes. Uh, Keith arrived at uh, KSU in 1999, where he's conducted grazing trials on modified intensive early stocking strategies and complementary grazing systems for the beef cow calf uh, producers and production. Um, he also has performed forage evaluations on the growth and persistence of several perennial cool season grasses for adaptation to the climate of Western Kansas. Another major aspect of Keith's research has involved the suppression or control of weedy plant, spe weedy plant species that have significant impacts on rangelands, particularly the honey locust, Japanese brome, and old world blue stems. Keith, the floor is yours. All righty, well, thank you very much. And I'll get my screen popped up here. Um, Walt gave a really nice introduction to this uh, two, two uh, presentation series and uh, a really nice introduction and then went on to talk about some particular species and their control and I'm going to continue on with that and I'm going to be talking about a few particular species, uh, namely honey locust, yucca or small soapweed and western ragweed in pasture. And uh, first I wanna bring up honey locust and the home range of honey locusts, it's, its native area to the US is basically the, the Ohio River Valley, Mississippi River Valley and the Eastern portion of the Great Plains. And um, over the course of time, over here on the right side of the screen, that map, that range of honey locusts has spread throughout most of the lower 48 states of the U.S. over the course of time. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that and the reasons why here in just, just a moment. But honey locust by itself as a single tree, it has really small leaflets and it allows uh, some light to pass through those leaves. And so a single tree doesn't really shade a lot of grass. But when you put several trees together and form a dense canopy. There's a lot of grass that gets shaded and it'll reduce production uh, of a pasture where we have, um, where we have basically some, uh, some solid stands of this occurring in some riparian areas and starting on some upland areas. But one of the main things that honey locust is known for is its characteristic thorns. And these thorns are a risk to livestock and a risk to humans because they are definitely sharp and they can, they can produce some really deep punctures in an animal or in a person. And that's also the case with equipment. There's been innumerable, innumerable tires that have fallen victim to these thorns when people have driven out and, and checked animals or um, just gone out and other, done other things in pasture and driving through a grove of these honey locust trees. And so they're, they're a hazard to people and they're also a hazard to equipment. And one of the ways that these uh, honey locust trees get spread throughout a pasture is through the pods. The pods are high in quality. They actually have a very high protein content. Animals readily eat them and they will spread them across the pasture. And um, deer, do consume those pods. And a study in the Cross Timbers area of Southern Oklahoma showed that 4% of, of a doe's, doe deer's uh, diet 
during the fall and winter consists of honey locust seeds. And so they do consume it, but I don't think they're probably a major cause of spread throughout a pasture where honey locust is found, but cattle are a major uh, cause of honey locust being spread throughout a pasture. In pastures where there are stands of honey locust trees in say a riparian area, cattle that graze in those pastures in the fall and the winter, they readily eat those uh, seed pods and the seeds, and then they deposit those in cow pies all throughout the pasture. And here we see a, a picture of a cow pie um, that was deposited in the prior fall or winter. And I'm outlining it here with my arrow and it's weathered some, but right in the middle of that are five new honey locust seedlings starting to emerge out of that cow pie. Uh, a cow pie is a perfect environment for a seedling to get started. It's high in nutrients and it also retains moisture very well once it's wet. And so it's a perfect environment for, for getting a plant started. Another reason why we have honey locusts increasing in pasture was alluded to by Walt and it's fire suppression. Uh, a, a prescribed fire that would go through a pasture where say that cow pie from the previous slide was located, a fire going through that pasture would readily burn those little seedlings that were starting to emerge. And so occasional fire or periodic fire going through a pasture will help control some of those young seedlings that would start to um, inhabit a pasture. So fire suppression is another cause for us seeing more, more honey locusts and other woody species in pastures. And we've also spread honey locusts to different areas ourselves. Uh, there are thornless varieties of honey locusts and some of those old thornless varieties, even though the tree themselves didn't have thorns on them, a lot of those old varieties did have the capability of producing seed, which then would produce a seedling that had thorns. Up to 40% of the seeds had that genetic potential in them from, from some of those old varieties that were planted in shelter belts throughout the Great Plains and also used as ornamentals in, uh, in homesteads and also in parks and, and things like that. So we helped increase the, the presence of honey locusts ourselves. Honey locusts will also spread in a pasture through resprouting. Uh, once, the, once a honey locust tree is cut, that stress on the tree causes buds to activate and it will initiate a sprout to emerge from those buds. And this is a, actually a photograph of a honey locust tree that was cut and then it was actually treated with a triclopyr plus diesel mixture. But even though it was treated, we can still see a ring of sprouts coming from around the base of that stump. And uh, that is pretty much unacceptable control. And it's another reason why we see more, more trees out in pasture from people cutting, cutting them down and possibly not, not treating them or not getting an effective control from, from a herbicide that they used. So some of the common methods for trying to control honey locusts in pasture, there's foliar treatments and we spray to cover all the leaves in the spring once full leaf emergence has occurred. And then um, Walt alluded to some of these other methods as well. In his talk, we have the uh, cut stump method, um, cutting the tree off and treating, treating the stump, frill or girdling. And then we also have a basal bark treatment. Now, um, out of these, the cut stump, frill, frill or girdling, and the basal bark, those methods can be done any time of the year. Um, the labels on most, most herbicides state that those methods are acceptable during any, any season, spring, summer, fall, or winter. Uh, the one limitation that we do have for, is for the basal bark treatment. And that treatment can be done any time of the year as long as the trunk or um, trunk or the bark is not wet from snow or rain. Uh, that snow or rain will keep the oil penetrant with the herbicide mixture from getting through the bark into the growing point, growing uh, layer of the tree. Here's an example of a honey locust tree that was cut down and then the outer part of the stump was treated. 
the live part of the tree when it was cut is actually where this dark band is around the outside of that stump. It's weathered differently than the dead portion on the inside of the, uh, of the stump. And so when a tree is cut down, a honey locust tree is cut, it is this outer area that needs to be treated with the herbicide. On larger trees that may be kind of dangerous to, to remove or cut down yourself, um, and you just want to treat them while standing, uh, you can what's called frill or girdle. And that is where you take a chainsaw or a hatchet and you cut a ring, a one to two inch ring all the way around the tree or in sections around the tree. And by cutting into the tree, you're cutting through the bark and you're getting to that live cambium layer of the tree. And then you apply the herbicide into that ring. And that will allow that tree to to take up that herbicide in that living layer and to translocate it to the roots where it needs to, needs to be translocated to, to control the tree. We also have the basal bark application and that is performed on a tree that's left standing, um, is not, not cut, no mechanical treatment done to it whatsoever. And the herbicide plus oil carrier mixture is applied to the lower 15 inches of that tree all the way around it. And if you have uh, additives or some other penetrants included in that mixture, you may be able to also use what's called the thin line basal treatment, which, which uh, Walt alluded to in his earlier talk. Um, but anyway, one limitation with this is it on labels where basal bark is able to be applied um, to a tree with a herbicide, the limitation is usually a six inch diameter tree or less that it's allowed to be applied on. Now, I, I had mentioned earlier that, uh, or had shown a picture of a stump that had sprouts around it that was treated with triclopyr plus diesel mixture. And I had received numerous phone calls from producers and agents that that one of the treatments that we'd been uh, talking about for a long time for honey locust control and pasture just didn't seem to be performing as well as it should have and it was that triclopyr plus diesel mixture that there were a lot of folks that were using that method and they were getting a lot of re-sprouts or more re-sprouts than what they thought they should be getting well about the time i was getting those phone calls Amino Pyrrolid or Milestone uh, had come out with a, a new label with new wording in it that allowed for it to be applied as a basal bark treatment on honey locust trees, or it could be used as a treatment on a cut stump. Um, those weren't on the earliest labels, but uh, they were added on later, later as the uh, um, as it was in production for a longer period of time. So anyway, this was a good opportunity for us to test uh, those different mixtures, triclopyr and, am and aminopyrrolid, and using it on different uh, application methods. So in a study that we did in 2012 and 2013, we looked at triclopyr plus diesel and aminopyrrolid plus bark oil and applied those two as a basal bark treatment on honey locust trees. And then we compared it to three stump treatments. And those three stump treatments were amino pyrrolid plus water, dicamba plus 2,4-D plus water, and the same triclopyr plus diesel that was applied as a basal bark, but we applied it as a stump treatment. Mm -hmm. And we applied each of those to 50, 50 trees each year um, and, or in the first year and 40 trees in the second year. So we had, we had a very large sampling of trees that we applied, applied these to. And what we we're looking for is one year after treatment, we came back to these trees and evaluated them to see if we had dead trees. And with the trees that were treated with basal bark treatment, we basically looked to see if there were any live green leaves left on the tree. If there were any green leaves at all, it was counted as a live tree. But we also looked at sprouts around the tree and in a six inch radius around each tree that was treated basal bark 
where each tree that was cut and the stump was treated, we looked in a, in a six foot radius around each tree looking for sprouts. And if we saw any sprouts, that tree was counted as a live tree rather than a controlled or dead tree. And so this is an example of what, what we were looking for. On the left, you can see a, a honey locust tree that was cut and treated. And I have circled here in, in black six sprouts that came up from treating that tree. Now, um, there may be sprouts that were, uh, that were emerging 15, 20 feet away from this tree because those roots from a tree can extend uh, along, uh, along a uh, great distance. But we, we use the six foot radius because we're pretty confident that if there was a, a sprout within six foot of a tree that was cut and treated or that we applied basal bark, that that sprout probably belonged to that tree rather than another tree that was located 20 or 30 feet away. So we counted all these, all these sprouts within a six foot radius of all the trees that we treated. And what we found averaged over the two years was that with the basal bark treatments, we got much better control with the amino pyrrolid plus bark oil treatment than we did with the triclopyr plus, plus diesel treatment. Over 20% greater control with the amino pyrrolid. Um, at looking at the stump treatments, we also got much better control with the amino pyrrolid and with the dicamba plus 2,4-D treatments than we did the triclopyr plus diesel treatment. And uh, looking at these, even though the dicamba plus 2,4-D treatment had statistically equal control, um, it really looks to me like uh, the amino pyrrolid treatments were far and away the top the top uh, treatments here. Uh, each one of those just barely under 100% control, which was basically one, one tree and uh, uh, I think three trees that were uh, having sprouts at some time. And here is a uh, summary of the percent of trees with sprouts. And it was one, one tree and three, three trees with those two treatments that produce sprouts. We also, but in looking at the, the count of sprouts per tree, they also had a low count number. When it did produce a sprout, it was a very low number of sprouts. Now you compare that to the triclopyr plus diesel treatment, especially the stump treatment. 46% um, of the trees cut produced a sprout and had almost five sprouts per stump. So that means if we started out with 100 trees and had 46% of them with sprouts and almost five sprouts per tree, that means we started out with 100 trees, but we ended up with over 200 sprouts. So um, that, that basically was an ineffective treatment in this study. We also looked two years after treatment and looked at the same thing. We looked at new sprouts and basically found that the triclopyr plus diesel as a stump treatment, again, had, had more sprouts and a percentage of the trees having sprouts than the uh, other treatments. And this was a common thing that we saw with the basal bark applied treatments in that study, that there was a small dead zone around the tree and that I believe was basically from the, the diesel fuel or the bark oil carrier as it uh, could have uh, sprayed or splashed off the trunk and landed on some of the vegetation uh, near the trunk. Um, there was this small dead zone the year after, but two years after treatment, this pretty much filled in in most all cases. We also saw what is called flashback, especially from the amino pyrrolid treatment. And this was basically from us treating small trees. And here it's indicated by the blue arrows and you can see the white stakes. Those were markers depicting where we treated some of our uh, stumps. And we, these were treated with amino pyrrolid 
And you can see that there are some larger trees that are basically 15 to probably 30 feet away that are honey locust trees that also died. Even though these trees were much too large to be included in our study, the treatment of these smaller trees close to them, uh, they had to have been connected by their root systems and that aminopyrrolid herbicide was translocated through the root system to those larger trees and controlled them. And this was really evident by another tree. This was about a 20 inch diameter tree. Um, and we treated two small stumps that were um, probably uh, 15 to, to 20 feet away from this tree. And we ended up killing this large tree even though we never applied any herbicide to it. Mm -hmm. So in summary with the honey locust uh, study, the amino, amino pyrrolid treatments were very effective at controlling honey locusts. And within a couple years, the uh, bark and some of the branches started sloughing off of these honey locust trees after treatment. So some recommendations for honey locusts for small trees uh, and seedlings, you use a prescribed burn regimen, periodic fire to help control those trees, but also most any herbicide that's used for must thistle could also be used to treat small, small seedlings and small trees up to uh, probably three or four foot high, as long as adequate foliar coverage um, takes place. Uh, basically need to make sure that all the leaves are covered with the herbicide. And um, most must thistle herbicides are going to be able to, to uh, control or suppress those, small, those smaller trees. For trees that are a little bit larger, up to six inches in diameter, um, you can basal bark treat the lower 15 inches with the immunopyrrolid plus bark oil. It was very effective. And for larger trees, um, cutting the tree down and treating the stump or doing a frill or girdle with amino pyrrolid in water um, or the dicamba plus 2,4-D um, were more effective in this study. If you do want to use triclopyr plus diesel to try to control honey locust trees, I would only use it as a basal bark treatment rather than as a stump treatment. And for the densest or tallest stands that basically just have too many trees in them to feasibly to be, um, be able to perform individual tree treatments. Um, broadcast foliar treat aerially with uh, amino pyrrolid plus 2,4-D mixture or a picloram plus 2,4-D mixture. And uh, with the densest and largest trees, add triclopyr in there as well. And uh, that, was, that was a mixture that Walt alluded to earlier as being one that can, can pretty much uh, be effective on, on most tree or brush species. So in, in looking at uh, doing a, an aerial treatment on honey locusts, um, coverage is important. And in order to get better coverage on, on trees in the canopy so that the lower leaves can also have a greater chance of getting herbicide on them, um, you can use more gallons per acre carrier. You can also spray from two different directions or you can spray in two out of three years. All those things will help increase the coverage, but they're also going to increase the cost. But you, you will get better coverage um, using those methods. I have put together here uh, a small little spreadsheet of some different herbicides that are effective as a foliar treatment or, um, uh, or different mixtures that can be used as a foliar treatment. I'm not gonna get into this right now and cover all these because uh, I believe we're gonna have this available for, for you all to look at after, after the presentations are over. So I think you can get on the web and, and look at these more closely. And I also have the same type of spreadsheet here for bark and stump treatments. And you'll be able to check those out later on, I believe. So right now, I, I guess I would just quickly stop to see if there's you know, just one quick or two quick questions about honey locusts that I could answer before moving on to the next, uh, next area. 
if anything's popped up on the chat. We, we currently don't have anything in the chat, uh, Keith, uh, but uh, I, I will ask one question, um, and it's going to be a broad one. Um, what is the biggest reason that the cut stump, cut stump method and application doesn't fail? Uh, okay, why, why did it, why did the, the stump treatment with the trichol pure plus diesel fail on honey locusts? Yeah. Well, um, not just that, but um, in general, when when guys are out treating them, even if they use the uh, the correct treatment of the ama, uh, well, the ama prolid, the uh, the the tri trichlopure plus diesel treatment is actually very effective on other species. It just seems to not be as effective on honey locusts, but it's it's very effective on other other tree species. Um, I believe it's because when that tree is cut down, it changes the apical dominance of all the buds and all the growing points in the tree. And I just don't think it translocates. It, 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 it messes the, I think the hormone system up in that tree and it just doesn't translocate as well. I, I have no way to prove that. That's just what my speculation is. However, the, the amino pyrrolid, it appeared to translocate very well and that. And we saw that flashback in getting other trees that were connected to the root system. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat, so uh, as you were. All right, I'll continue on then and talk about yucca or small soapweed. And it's found throughout the Great Plains from, from Mexico all the way up to Canada. Very common here throughout Kansas. Grows well on dry slopes and dry uplands. And it also can grow very well in, in loamy and rocky, rocky type soils, some sandy soils. Um, it, it is adapted to most locations in Kansas. Um, it's semi-woody and stemless except for the flower stalk that it puts up every, every spring. And the leaves are very fibrous and, and thick and prickly. But even though it is very fibrous. Deer will browse on the tender uh, whorls of yucca plants, and they also will feed on the flowers and the young pods of yucca. And if anybody has ever watched cattle uh, turned out into a new pasture where yuccas are flowering, the cattle, uh, cattle will basically run from yucca plant to yucca plant trying to eat the flowers before their neighbor does. So uh, those flowers must either be highly nutritious or have, have a great flavor or taste to, to cattle because they do love to eat those flowers as well. Yucca plants can form dense colonies. They have a very massive root system and it almost impossible to pull up a small yucca plant because of its, because of its root system. Um, and because of those massive root systems, they use a lot of water or have a lot of water contained within them. And so they're, they're able to use moisture that could be used by grass for grass growth and the leaves also will shade grass. There are some herbicides that have some labeling for broadcast application to control yucca and those are metsulfuron products, uh, Cimarron Plus and Chaparral. Those two herbicides with metsulfuron have labeling which allow them to be mixed with 2,4-D ester to be able to control yucca as a broadcast treatment. And it is specifically labeled as 2,4-D ester that has to be used. And so with this, uh, with this labeling, um, Walt and I actually did a study, um, it was probably 10 or 12 years ago, that we did in Southern Trigo County on a stand of yucca. And in this stand of yucca, um, we included these herbicide treatments with that, with that uh, labeling of supplementing with 2,4-D ester. And we performed this by counting all, all the yucca plants that were within a plot before we treated those plots. And then we based our control on the number of um, dead plants compared to live plants at the start of the study. So dead plants at the end of the study compared to the total live plants 
at the start. And we apply these herbicides in June and in September. And we looked one year after treatment and 15 months after treatment. And this is what we are looking for. We are basically looking for gray yucca plants, which means they, they had, had died and had weathered. And we are looking for any signs of green. And if there was any sign of green, it was called a live plant. And that included plants that looked like most of it was dead, but there might have been green coming out of the whorls. Those were counted as live plants. Now, the, the treatments that we used were combinations of metsulfuron methyl products um, and uh, 2,4-D. And the, the mixtures that we used that had the best control for the June treatment were the Cimarron Plus and the Chaparral treatment, but also the Escort Plus Weed Master Plus 2,4-D treatment. Each of those had over 60% uh, control as a broadcast treatment, with just, just one, one broadcast treatment. So averaged over the two years, um, compared to individually applying herbicide to each yucca plant, that was actually better control than what I might have been expecting. Um, but it... Uh, um, it was pretty, pretty good control, especially when you look at Escort alone, 36% and Escort plus Weedmaster was only 26%. Now folks that are familiar with Weedmaster know that it has 2,4-D in it, um, but that 2,4-D is an amine for you, formulation. And so metsulfuron methyl plus 2,4-D amine did not improve yuck control at all. But when that 2,4-D ester was included, it greatly increased the uh, yucca control. The other treatment that had um, over 60% control from that June application was 2% remedy plus diesel um, in the world of the plant. And that had 77% control in the spring. Now in, in the fall of the year is when most perennial plants are um, photosynthesizing and trying to store carbohydrates for, for winter storage so that they can stay alive in the winter and so they can start growth in the spring, produce new growth. And so I thought that the September application that we, we used, that we were going to see numbers even better than these numbers that we, that we saw in the spring. But when we did our evaluations, basically every single one of them was more poor than the spring application. None of the treatments that were broadcast applied had over 35% control when we applied them in September. However, the remedy plus diesel in the world had almost 90% control. So that individual treatment was, was very good. And I think that the reason that we may have not had as good a control in September versus June is I think that those leaves, as they went through the growing season, those yucca leaves hardened, and it was harder for those uh, for that herbicide to penetrate into the leaf and get translocated throughout the plant. Mm. So what we saw the year after we applied the treatments was that we had many dead yucca plants, and we actually started to see some uh, some grass starting to grow up through some of those uh, controlled yucca plants. And in some of the areas where we had the largest density of, of yucca plants um, in some of the more dense colonies, we saw dead plants, but we often saw some, some plants still surviving or some, some young plants that maybe escaped the treatment. So uh, we had some decent control with some of the treatments, but we still saw some surviving. Now there's other ways that you can reduce yucca. Uh, Walt talked about fire earlier, and fire does reduce yucca leaf area and canopy cover area, and so um, fire can reduce the competition of yucca with surrounding grass, but it will not kill the yucca. The deep, the deep root and the deep growing point of yucca plants 
basically it helps it to escape uh, fire treatment. And so um, fire usually will not control a yucca stand, but it can help reduce the competition of the yucca with grass around it by reducing the, the total leaf and canopy area of the plant. Another way to try to reduce yucca is through winter grazing. Uh, winter grazing has been shown in areas where it's been used. In, in, in some instances, yucca ha populations have been reduced. And basically what occurs is animals will get down and graze or browse on the lower portion of the, of the yucca plant and will end up injuring it and uh, end up controlling it. Mm -hmm. So some recommendations for yucca and graze pasture. Um, you can use a prescribed burning regimen to try to reduce the, the leaf area, the canopy area, so that there's less competition with, um, with grass. Um, for small populations or, or sparse populations, I would use the 2% triclopyr plus diesel mixture. Um, it seems to be a mixture that works very well and you will not injure any grass around the yucca plant like you can with other individual plant methods to control yucca such as using the hexazinone treatment that Walt talked about earlier. Um, for really dense populations, a broadcast treatment of metsulfuron methyl plus 2,4-D ester mixture during flowering was the best treatment in our study. And controlling uh, 60 to 65% of that stand um, puts a really big dent in that population. And then uh, you may be able to follow up the, re the remaining treatment of other plants with, with individual treatment after that broadcast application. That broadcast application can save a lot of, lot of time and money um, in labor and in herbicide expense from doing an individual plant treatment. So I'll pause quick and see if we have any uh, questions on yucca control. I will give anybody's chance to uh, type anything in the chat, but in the meantime, I had a question. Um, maybe I did miss it, but are there any mechanical, strictly a mechanical control methods for yucca? You did mention cattle can damage it by grazing it in the winter time. Can you mow uh, it? Or? Um, there are, there is mechanical treatment that you can do to um, basically pop the plants out of the ground with um, with the tractor and loader or a skid steer or some sort of equipment like that. Um, because it has such a deep root system and uh, a deep growing point, um, I don't know if the, that method is always effective because they may be able to re-sprout. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to, to get a plant out of the ground. Um, it basically would take some sort of mechanical treatment like that with, um, with some sort of power equipment to, to get that done. I don't, Walt, well, if he's on and listening, he, I guess he may have some experience with, with that. I don't know if he's um, seen that done or know any producers that have used that method or not. I had questions regarding that, but uh, again, I, I think you know, it's, they're probably gonna recover. They're gonna re-sprout at some point in time. It might be similar to like when you burn, you know, you kind of, you could you get rid of that top growth would get rid of some of the cover and so forth. But of course, when you're, depending what device you're using, you may cause some additional damage to the soil surface though, uh, compared to burning, so. Yeah, that, that is true. I don't know that'd be very effective. It, it would definitely be costly. Yeah. Definitely be costly. Okay, I don't see any other any questions coming up in the chat on Yucca at the moment. Okay, well, I guess I'll continue on then. And the next thing I'm gonna talk about is this nice bright green forb right here, and that is Western ragweed. Um, Western ragweed is one of our most common perennial forbs in rangeland throughout the state. Um, forbs, as Walt mentioned earlier, can make up a significant portion of a 
of a cow of a beef beef cow's diet um, through the year, and it was found in some early studies done out here at Hayes in the 1950s and 60s that uh, the composition of Western ragweed in our pastures during that time period ranged from from one percent to 34 percent on a dry matter basis. So that, that's a pretty high composition. And in evaluating my grazing studies done here from 2002 to 2014, we had from zero to 21% composition of Western ragweed in our pastures. So it, it does have quite a broad range of population um, from, from year to year. Um, it can, can vary quite a bit. Um, in that earlier study, that 1950s to 60s study, the yield of western ragweed in, pat, in the study pastures was 710 pounds an acre, which is, you know, quite a lot. That's almost, uh, almost half of a large round bale per acre. And they found that 49% of the western ragweed that was produced in the pastures those years, an average of 49% of it was consumed. So out of, out of that 710 pounds per acre, um, I, I guess I shouldn't say 49% cons was consumed, but 49% of it disappeared during the growing season with, with grazing taking place. And in our studies from 2002 to 2014, uh, yield of Western ragweed averaged just over 200 pounds an acre. So we have had significant populations of Western ragweed in our study pastures here, here at Hayes over the years. Um, Western ragweed is a plant that has a um, very extensive lateral rootstock system. So a plant will form um, a lateral bud and will start a new plant growing next to it, similar to what grasses with rhizomes do. So you can have sparse plants that eventually turn into dense colonies. Um, and we have some other plants that have that same kind of growth form. Um, and I'm gonna talk about those um, in just a little bit, but Western ragweed over the course of time here at Hayes has had fluctuation in its population. Um, you notice here in 2006, 2006 and also 2011 and 2012, we had big reductions in Western ragweed composition in our pastures. And those two years or those two time periods are two of our driest time periods that we have on record. And so in years where we had a dry fall and went into a dry spring and summer the next year, we saw significant reductions in Western ragweed, where we had 10% of the composition um, in the stand the year before. So climatic variation and environmental conditions um, can be causes of some cycling of the Western ragweed composition in our pastures. So composition can be highly precipitation dependent. And I can tell you that over the last few years where we've had um, significant amounts of rain above average out here at Hayes, our Western ragweed populations have basically been climbing each year. Now, um, about 10 or 12 years ago, I was doing a study where I was looking at the effects of a particular herbicide on different perennial forbs in pasture and Western ragweed was our most dominant forb. And we were applying different levels of this herbicide in plots in our, in our pasture. And that enabled us to produce um, stands of Western ragweed with variable populations where it made up variable composition uh, compared to grass in, in, in each plot. And so in looking at that data, and graphing it, I basically found that there was a relationship between Western ragweed production and native grass production, and found that the inflection point 
of where Western ragweed composition will start to reduce native grass production was close to 35 to 40% of the composition being Western ragweed. So when Western ragweed started or approached 35 to 40% of the stand, as far as dry matter is concerned, it started to reduce grass production. And I went and looked at an earlier study done in the 1950s by John Launchbaugh, which he did on a site that was a more productive site and looked at his data and how much ragweed was produced in an area before it started to reduce grass production. And it basically showed close to the same inflection point that when about 40% of the population or composition of the stand was Western ragweed, the competition started to reduce native grass production. Now I mentioned a little bit ago about some perennial plants that we have that have uh, similar uh, root forms and growth uh, as Western ragweed. Walt talked about curly cut gum weed, but we also have Louisiana sagewort, this plant here on the right, gets a, a white fuzzy surface to it. Um, and we see it growing out in pasture, uh, similar to what we do Western ragweed. Here's some, some small colonies of Western ragweed and Louisiana sagewort growing in an area that was uh, disturbed next to a road. But we see areas of this where uh, it may be making up more than 40% of the composition, right, in, in that direct area where it's growing. And there's, there's some other plants such as uh, um, some goldenrods may have, have uh, similar production where they have root stalks that can form dense colonies that we may, may possibly see similar things where when we get uh, to a point where it is over 35 to 40% of the composition on a dry matter basis that it may start to reduce grass, um, grass composition in that area or grass production. So um, when we talk about herb, herbicide treatment, um, it's probably not going to be economical until it gets close to that 35 to 40% uh, range of composition. Um, and if we do approach that level in pastures, uh, there are a few things that you can treat. Uh, Western ragweed with that are very effective on control. Um, one to two quarts per acre 2,4-D or one to two quarts per acre of 2,4-D with some added dicamba. Amino pyrrolid at five to seven ounces is effective and so is a uh, one to two pints per acre picloram. And so when, when uh, we have populations approaching that 40% composition area, um, it could be warranted to to treat uh, Western ragweed or some of these other perennials. Um, but one thing that we do have to remember is that the environment and climatic conditions can cause some wide fluctuations, just like what we had here at Hayes in 2006 and, and 2011 and 12, that we saw significant population declines, even though we did no treatment whatsoever. It was just a natural occurrence of the, of the environment at the time. And other other perennial plants, uh, I think, probably are going to be going through cycles like that as well. And a lot of times, the the problems that people perceive of of weed problems out in pasture aren't necessarily production problems, um, but are more aesthetic problems than what what they are uh, um, production oriented. So when we look at treating um, western ragweed or or other perennials perennial forbs in pasture. Um, based on some of the, on the graphing of those studies that I showed uh, a couple slides ago, where if we treat Western ragweed on a low production area and we get 400 pounds per acre of new grass growth versus a more productive uh, area where we get a thousand pounds of production by controlling ragweed, um, at a cost of 10 to $20 an acre, there's a significant difference in the cost per ton of, of uh, new forage produced. Um, 
with those different uh, levels of control and different levels of production potential. Can range anywhere from $20 per ton to $100 per ton. So uh, knowing what kind of site you have and what your production costs are going to go a long ways into uh, letting you determine whether or not it's going to e be economically feasible for you to do any sort of treatment. And so um, there are other alternative ways to try to control pasture weeds and, and Walt talked about some of these before. Um, these would fall into what I guess would be considered integrated pest management. And that's basically managing to try to control um, problem species through other methods to reduce the effect of herbicides and herbicide residues on the environment. And one of those, of course, is burning, which Walt covered some in his earlier talk in which I alluded to some with uh, honey locusts and yucca. But grazing can also be an effective method to try to target some, some species that are considered to be problems in pasture. So um, targeted grazing is the term that is often used for, excuse me, often used for trying to directly or indirectly control a species um, of an undesirable plant in a pasture. And in doing this, in most cases, it's often best to use a high density of animals for a short period of time to get the effect that you want to try to reduce the population of that problem plant. Now, you, you can't just go out and, um, and graze on these plants any time and get the effect you want. Um, basically, what we're trying to do with targeted grazing is we're trying to get that animal to consume or impact the pest or the invasive species uh, the most that it can. And what we're trying to get that animal to do is to reduce the leaf area, to reduce the vigor of those plants, and to try to reduce the ability of that plant to be able to produce buds or produce seeds. So we're not only trying to lower the vigor, the plant as it is growing out in the pasture, but we're also trying to reduce the, the number of seedlings or propagules for future plants that that uh, invasive species could, could produce. And in order to do that, we need to know our target species as uh, well as possible. Um, for, is, for instance, um, we need to know the, uh, the anatomy and the physiological differences of, say, controlling yucca versus controlling Japanese brome versus controlling skunk brush in a pasture. All three of those are going to have different time periods of when they should be targeted and are going to be most effective in, in reaching control. And they're also going to, going to be different in the ideal species that would be used to try to um, control these. So with yucca plants, um, using grazing as a control, we'd be grazing in the wintertime um, and we'd be grazing with, with beef cattle. With Japanese brome, we'd be grazing early in the spring, uh, basically from the end of March to sometime in April, when that plant is just starting to put up its uh, seed heads, when it's going into the elongation phase is when it's gonna be impacted the most. And so that's the time period when we'd wanna have the most animals on that area to try to control, um, try to control Japanese brome. Whereas with skunk brush, we're going to want to have goats grazing instead of, or goats browsing instead of having cattle trying to um, be the control mechanism. And we're going to be wanting those animals out there on the skunk brush after it's fully leafed out to reduce as much leaf area as possible on that plant, to reduce its amount of carbohydrate that it's going to be storing and putting into its root system. So knowing the anatomy and physiology and the growth periods of our target plants is key in being able to control them with grazing. And for each plant, it's good to have some sort of uh, prescription um, uh, grazing plan in order to try to control it. 
Now, in, in doing this, we may not always completely eliminate the pest, but in many cases or most cases, we're at least going to be able to suppress it or, or to slow the spread of that plant. An indirect effect of grazing and controlling invasive plants or undesirable plants in pasture is um, using what Walt had alluded to earlier, and that is a stocking rate that's going to allow those uh, pastures or those rangelands to be as healthy as possible and to have as much vigor as possible. The healthier a stand is, um, the better it's going to be able to compete with any invading plant and be able to, to try to ward it off and to be able to, to withstand um, competition. So the healthier a rangeland system is, the better it's going to be able to um, compete and prevent undesirables from trying to uh, come into that area. They offer, they offer a high level of resistance, um, healthy grass, healthy pasture and rangelands do. So uh, in the end, uh, when trying to control um, species through grazing, uh, you should know your friends well, but know your enemies even better. You should know when and how your target species is gonna be most susceptible and how you're gonna be able to most affect it. And with that, that's basically all I have. I guess I say that's all I have, but I've used up quite a bit of time. I'll take any questions if anybody is still on to, to be able to ask questions. Yeah, we have some uh, viewers still, um, and so far none of them have chimed in in the chat. Uh, I will give them some time to do that. Um, I had a question on, you know, the, the ragweed side of things. Uh, you mentioned way early about, uh, you, you started to say consumed, and then you changed your answer to disappear. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> I, was just, yeah. I was just curious um, what, what your thoughts are on cattle's um, ability to eat uh, ragweed. Well, um, I, I, I changed from, from consumed to disappeared because, uh, with continuous stalking, which is basically how that study was performed. It was continuously stalked through the growing season from May through October. Um, the amount of forage that disappears, half of the disappearance is usually from animals consuming the forage. And the other half is from insects consuming the forage, wildlife consuming the forage, or parts of the plant basically um, sloughing off over time, becoming mature and having plant parts fall off and falling to the ground as litter. And so not everything that disappears is actually consumed. So that, that's why I changed that. 49% um, of it disappeared. They didn't actually measure consumption, they, did, they measured disappearance. So that's why I changed that. Mm -hmm. So to add on to that, are you aware of any studies that cattle do consume ragweed? Because I've heard um, that it's fairly good quality feed, up to 20, 25 percent um, well, protein. I, I knew that I know that they will consume ragweed. I've watched them consume some ragweed. Um, how much I don't know. You'd have, uh, I guess, I don't know of a, of a diet study that specifically looked at ragweed as a species. Um, I in in eastern Kansas, I know that Walt took part in a study where they were looking at steer diets compared to sheep diets. I don't know if Western ragweed was included in that or not, if there was any, any data on consumption of ragweed in those. There yeah. was, you know, we had uh, two or three ragweed species. We had common ragweed as well. I, I, and I, I can't recall right off the top of my head. I, uh, you know, we're, we were, that study was primarily, we were interested in whether they're going to consume Cerecia laspidiza, but. Right. Uh, Rag, there was ragweed available in, in the pasture, and again, I my I would almost I would think that the sheep uh, that were using that study would consume more ragweed than the steers did. I, I would assume that would be the case as well. Okay. Um, again, if there's anyone out there that wants to add a question, uh, please feel free to throw that up in the in the chat. 
Um, one that we were kind of, we paused on, Sandra typed it in our chat here on the side. And, uh, but just uh, so you and maybe Walt and Keith both can um, expand on this, but uh, what's your opinion on year round grazing versus conventional grazing and how it relates to weed control? And that's a loaded question. I'm aware of that. <laughs> Um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering if, if she means year round grazing as grazing on the same pasture year round, or does she mean year round grazing by rotating from uh, say native rangeland to a cool season pasture to say a cover crop or um, having some sort of year round forage or are you, or exactly what do you mean by year round grazing? Well, this was brought up in my program development committee for ag and um, they just mentioned year round grazing. So I'm assuming I may be wrong. I'm assuming the same pasture um, because I mean, I was out collecting soil samples and there's uh, cattle still out on pastures. Okay. So I don't know. And by, by conventional grazing, I guess maybe they, they mean, um, continuous grazing through the growing season, just during the growing season? Right, like typical yeah. May to October. Okay. Um, well, I guess first off, um, both of those are going to be methods where animals are going to have um, highly selective um, diets. You know, they're going to be able to go out and really select the plants that they want to consume in both cases, um, at least at the stocking rates they should be stocked at for those long time periods. Those animals should have a lot of selective ability. And um, I guess I would think that those would possibly end up with this with almost the same result. Uh, because in, in year round grazing on the same pasture, year round, if it was done at the proper stocking rate, um, you know, there, those animals out on winter pasture, they would be consuming plant parts that basically are no longer photosynthesizing. So those, those plants aren't required or relying on that leaf area in order to make it through the winter and to survive. So I, I guess I would say if it was done at the proper stocking rates for, for the time periods that are out there, that there might not be much difference between the two. I don't know, Walt, Walt can chime in what he thinks. No, I, I, I would agree, Keith. I, I think, again, it gets back to stocking rate, as long as they aren't uh, abusing the land where they're taking off or causing a lot of disturbance to the soil surface. I don't think we'd see a whole lot of difference. Uh, you know, the we can, you know, sometimes people uh, will reserve a pasture and just use it during the winter time. And, and that can be done. And we know that that's not going to be harmful at all. Uh, again, it goes back to, because we aren't hurting the, the carbohydrate storage and stuff. What would the impact that could have is as you remove foliage during the winter time, uh, you don't have, you know, you don't have uh, the ability to capture maybe snowfall, you know, so you might might affect your water cycle more than than anything else. But it don't it won't damage the vigor of the plants by you can remove a higher percentage of it during the winter time, in other words, than you can during the growing season and not hurt it. Now, what effect that could have on you know, on the weeds and stuff? I think it depends on the level of if there's actually disturbance there that allow those plants maybe to come in. Okay, I uh, appreciate the answer on that, guys. Uh, we do have a, a question in the chat here. Uh, I believe uh, this could be either one, but I think it's uh, aimed towards Keith. In environmentally sensitive areas, what cut stump treatment would you use on locust trees? In environmentally sensitive areas, aminopyrrolid is probably going to be the safest treatment. Um, one thing I didn't talk about was picloram. Uh, Picloram or Tordon 22K has a supplemental label available on the CDMS uh, labels website online that can be downloaded. And that supplemental label states that 
picloram or Tordon 22K can be used with the same basal bark and stump mixtures as amino pyrrolid. So it can be used in grazed pasture now, whereas before that label wasn't available. And those two herbicides, I think, are the two most active herbicides on honey locusts. And out of those two, amino pyrrolid, I think, is by far the, the more safe herbicide, especially for sensitive areas. Um, it is not translocated as well through the soil. Um, and in the area where I did this, this study, the stump and bark treatment study, there were other trees in that area. It was, it was a riparian area that probably had a higher water table than most areas um, in the surrounding region. And we had elm trees, we had uh, some willow trees, we had cedar, cedar trees all in this area. And uh, none of those were affected by the amino pyrrolid treatment. <laughs> And uh, amino pyrrolid is, um, is supposed to be able to be applied right up to water's edge, according to the label. Hey, Keith, uh, this is Clinton, but uh, would you be able to share kind of some of the more common names of those herbicides that you were mentioning? Yeah, the tri triclopyr, uh, a common name is Remedy, Remedy products. And then the amino pyrrolid is milestone. Okay, those are those are the two uh, I guess that I probably use the most that were uh, just herbicide names and chemical names and not the actual herbicide. The triclopyr is remedy, and amino pyrrolid is milestone. Thank you. All right, thank you for that answer. Um, and I just, at that, before we go on to the next question we have, but I just wanna mention each extension office will have these available, um, the uh, chemical weed control books available. They come out every year. Um, so stop by your extension office and get a copy of that and it'll help you out a lot with any of your uh, uh, chemical questions. Um, the next question comes uh, talking about, it's a different species we haven't mentioned today, but uh, actually a couple species, old world blue stem. Uh, I know both of you have done a little bit of research on that, um, but it's referring a question specifically about arsenal and how it uh, works on old world blue stem. Well, I, I guess, Walt, I, I'll let you start on that one and then I'll okay. add later. I think we, we pretty well agree that on the, the two herbicides that seem to work are, are arsenal, or which is amazapyr or glyphosate, Roundup products. Those are the two chemicals we found that work the best on old world blue stem at this time. Um, the advantage that I've seen with, with the arsenal at, a, let's say, that a half pound rate is that it's uh, fairly safe to, to use on native grass. Uh, you know, it's pretty selective on the old world blue stem and, and not damage the the native grass as much, so it has has that advantage. Um, uh, year in, year out, you know, I, where we've been comparing maybe a half pound of arsenal with uh, two pounds of a glyphosate product. Um, probably over most years, the glyphosate is probably a little more effective, unless it's dry. When it when it gets dry, uh, two pounds uh, is not as effective as that half pound rate, and that probably I think it has to do with residual activity. The arsenal will stay in the system for a while, whereas uh, glyphosate doesn't have any soil activity. Uh, so I think that's that's a key difference. And uh, I guess I'll add on to that by talking about a, an area in Ellsworth County that I've been evaluating for, for the past couple of years. Um, but there's a producer that has a large acreage there that they applied arsenal for three years in a row at a half pound rate to a stand that had overall blue stem in it, Caucasian overall blue stem. Uh, the stand started out at 51% cover overall blue stem uh, before they started to apply the arsenal. And after three years of arsenal treatment, that pasture is down to under 2% um, cover. So they have had a significant decline in overall blue stem cover. 
uh, from the arsenal treatment. Um, you can imagine going from 51% cover to 2% cover that that's a lot of vegetation missing. And what ended up taking the place of overall blue stem, um, that area was pretty much dominated by Western ragweed and mare's tail. Um, I should stay, say at the start of before, at the start of uh, treatment that native tall grasses in this pasture had a cover of about 10% and those increased to the mid, mid to upper 20s as far as percent cover combined all together. So there was a significant reduction of oral blue stem and a significant increase in native grasses, but native grasses aren't going to increase near as quickly as what that oral blue stem disappeared. And so something had to take that place and what took that place was Western ragweed and mare's tail, which ended up being okay because um, those plants were serving a purpose. They were holding the soil in place. So even though they weren't necessarily desirable as far as uh, forage is concerned, they were serving, serving a purpose that they were occupying the area and keeping the soil from moving. Um, now, after, after the third year of treatment, um, this person wanted to or needed to seed with native grasses. And they did that this spring and they seeded with a mixture of, of native warm season grasses and also had some native forbs included in there. And basically in doing the evaluations, I found that the areas that had the greatest oral blue stem cover prior to treatment were the areas that had the greatest native grass seedling establishment after seeding this spring. So um, that, that's good news because it's been shown that oral blue stem, Caucasian oral blue stem and yellow oral blue stem both have had allelopathic effects on native grasses where it's reduced native grass growth and basically has prevented seedling growth from occurring um, in a greenhouse and lab setting. So um, seeing these native grasses established in an area that was so highly dominated by oral blue stem is actually a good sign that we can go back into those areas and establish some native grasses after, after a few years. All righty, I uh, will give just a couple more minutes uh, for any qu any questions to come on in. I, I haven't seen any others, uh, but I do want to mention we do have an evaluation for this program that we would appreciate if you would fill out um, at the end. It will be in the description in the link. And uh, again, I'll let uh, I will let Justine wrap us up here. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Okay, um, as Brett said, there's a, an evaluation here for you guys. And um, I just wanna kind of take a moment to express how important this is to us as agents. Um, the entire evaluation should really only take less than five minutes to fill out. And it can honestly mean, make a world of a difference to us as agents um, and our future programming. With everything going on, it's kind of difficult for us to connect with you guys and have a conversation after a program about what you thought or what you'd like to see in the future. So we really depend a lot on these evaluations to get a feel for what you guys think and also help us succeed in delivering educational programs that are really beneficial to your lives and your operation. So um, if you could just take a moment to fill that out, that is in the chat box and that will also be linked in the YouTube description um, when this is posted later to our websites in the YouTube channel it'll be in that description so if you are watching this video at a later date you can also fill that out um, which brings me to my next point this whole entire program and presentations are recorded so if you um, missed the presentations or you want to go back and re-watch them um, they will be available on each one of the extension websites um, and as well as some of the YouTube. So you can definitely go back and watch those as well. All righty. 
Uh, one more topic. Um, if you want copies of the presentations of any of the speakers, those will also be posted on all of our um, district websites. So, uh, or just contact your extension agent and they'd be able to get that for you. Any other questions? Okay, again, thanks for participating and please watch all of our websites, district websites. There will be future um, um, meetings coming up and actually there's one next week um, and I might, might wanna push that one too. It's our cattle marketing and tax uh, program. Um, it is in the evening, it will be December 15th. Um, um, it starts at 7 p.m. There is a registration site um, up as well. So all of our extension districts have that um, link where you can register for that as well. So um, there'll be other programs coming up too after the first of the year. And unfortunately, according to uh, the pandemic, we'll probably be doing lots of virtual programs here in the near future. So um, ideally, we'd like to see you each face-to-face but uh, we cannot do that and for safety reasons, uh, at least we, we still wanna connect with you and engage with you and provide the information from K-State Research and Extension. So with that, do any of the other agents have anything or the speakers? Okay, again, have a nice evening and I wish you Merry Christmas and we'll see you next Tuesday evening for the Cattle Marketing and Tax Program. Thanks again.